Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to uh, see you here, particularly if you are visiting with us. If you're here for the first time or haven't been for a while, it's just great to see you. My name is Ian. I'm the minister for the church and the community um, here in Stockett Hill, and I hope you've been made to feel welcome. And welcome to the folks who are joining us, either watching at home or listening in on the phones or wherever you're joining us from as well. Um, as our service goes on. Hopefully, everything will be um, clear. In a moment, Sarah is going to lead us in a time of worship, and for that, we'll be using um, songs and prayers and words. The words of the songs will appear on the screen behind me here. Some of the songs you may know, some of the songs you may not know. Um, that's okay. Um, if you don't know them, listen, allow the music and the words to, to minister to you and, and join in uh, if and when you want to. Indeed, join in with as much or as little of the whole service as you feel comfortable with. Normally, you'll see that we stand to sing, but many people remain seated as well. So just whatever is comfortable uh, for you. Um, after a time of worship, um, uh, we'll come back or we'll read from God's Word. We'll uh, reflect on that for a while, think about that, and then we'll respond to that in prayer in an, a way that, that is appropriate. Before we do all of that, though, let me just um, draw your attention to, to one or two things that are in our notices sheet. Uh, first of all, next Sunday, of course, is Remembrance Sunday. Uh, that means that the sort of formal part of our service will start around about quarter to 11 um, in order for us to keep the two-minute silence at 11 o'clock. So do uh, make sure you're, you're on time uh, for that um, next Sunday. And then after our service is our uh, monthly litter pick. Um, in the community. So um, if uh, you'd like to stay for that, uh, please do. Uh, I really want to encourage folks to be part of that. It's great fun. Um, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really sociable. Uh, you might think uh, going and picking up bits of litter, why would I want to do that? Uh, well, A, it's a blessing on our community. Uh, and B, it is a great way just to, to spend time um, with one another. And some folks from outside the church also come and join us as well. Um, we often folks bring a, a wee packed lunch with them and we have that through the house before we get going. So, so do, do join us for that if you can. A week on Tuesday, we've got our uh, prayer meeting with our sister churches, with those that we're uh, sharing a, a common future with. And um, uh, that's going to be on uh, Tuesday the 14th at seven o'clock out in Dice Church. So if you'd like a uh, uh, lift out to there, please do talk to me. Again, it's almost as important as picking up litter. In fact, no, I think it's possibly more important. Than, I don't know. Yeah, more important than picking up litter. So I really want to encourage you to come to that again. That's always a, a great thing uh, to do. I um, think everything else is there that you can just uh, look at. But I want to draw your attention to those things. We're here, first and foremost, in order to give God God's proper place. Um, both as individuals, to recognize that, that, that we don't always give God God's proper place, recognize God for who God is, um, uh, and we need to take a hold of ourselves and, and step in towards the Lord, uh, come into the presence of God, uh, and realize and recognize and, 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 and pay honor to who God is and who we are before the Lord. And we need to do that together as God's people. We need to recognize uh, who we are and who we're called to be and whose we are, and so give honor and glory to God. So that's what we're going to do just now. I'm going to lead, hand over to Sarah to lead us in worship. Thanks, Sarah. Have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Lord is saying to us this morning. We've come to listen to God's word. And so I'm going to read from Ephesians 1, 17 to 23. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as his mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Let's stand as we are able and worship our God together. Ah. Uh. 
inside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you. He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. we come to you with open hearts, full of worship and thanks for who you are, for all that you have done. We come to you, our God, creator, savior, comforter, and friend, to honor you together. You meet us here today. You journey with us so we can know you better. Today, we lift up our eyes to you. Open our hearts that we would know your presence here, Lord Jesus. May our hearts burn within us as we remember the riches of heaven's gifts to us through Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for bearing our sins that we lay before you now. We receive your mercy and forgiveness. We pray that we would see more of your transforming grace at work in every step of our lives through the work of your Holy Spirit. Meet us here, Lord Jesus, with your scars of love. Lift us up. You have come to save us. We trust in you for the journey ahead, that our faith would grow as we step out with you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that your power would be at work in us. We pray in and through the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
I have a home, eternal home. But for now, I walk this broken world. You walked it first. You know our pain, but you show hope can rise again up from the grave. Abide with me. Abide with me, don't let me fall, and don't let go, walk with me, never leave, ever close, God abide with me, there in the night, Gethsemane, before the cross, before the nails, overwhelmed, alone you prayed, you met us in our suffering and bore our shame. Abide with me, abide with me, don't let me fall. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Let's pray together. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your love. Open up our eyes to see you and our ears to hear your voice. Show us how to love others in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Amen. Thanks, Sarah. We sing these songs not because life is wonderful and we're all skipping along and we're going, oh God, isn't this great, hurrah, but because it isn't, because we need to cry out, Lord, open the eyes of my heart to see your love. Lord, abide with me. Lord, I'm crying out to you. That's, that's, that's why we sing these songs, because they're true and because we need to. Um, before, we, before we move on and... Um, uh, turn to God's Word. I just wonder, whilst we were worshipping, whether 
or, or as you were preparing for worship, whether you felt the Lord give you a particular scripture or there might be a, a, a picture or a word that would be of encouragement to others. There may not be, but just a, if anybody felt they wanted to share anything just now, particular scripture that came from the Lord. No, it's okay. Well, we're going to turn and we're going to read from God's Word now, and, and Hillary's going to read as we continue to go through Exodus from Exodus chapter 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jezebites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horab. Now, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the Tent of Meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the Tent of Meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance. While the Lord spoke with Moses, whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know, by, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you can stand, where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Amen. Amen. 
This is the Word of God. Shall we, shall we just pray together before we continue? Lord God, we do want to thank You for Your Word which You've given to us, and we want to thank You for Your Spirit which helps us to understand Your Word, to receive Your Word, and we want to thank You for one another that together we receive Your Word, together we hear it, together we seek to understand it, and together we, help, we seek to help one another to follow Jesus according to Your Word. So send Your Spirit amongst us now. Open up our hearts, our minds to receive what You would teach us and say to us through Your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Many of uh, the sort of conversations that I have with people going through difficult times, you know, times of grief or or times of illness or or times of um, crisis, people very often say something like, I don't know how others get through this without faith, or words to that effect. Um, I don't know how other people manage without a belief in God. Very often folks say that to me, and, and, and I I, I agree. I, I, I agree in so many ways. How do you get through life without trusting that God is with you, that God is at work, that God is working out God's purposes, and that God is where we will end up? W- without all of that, how, how do you cope with life? I suspect I'm preaching to the choir, at least uh, uh, mainly, uh, maybe not to all. Um, I... I Truthfully, I I also sometimes look back over my own life, and I wonder where I would be without God in my life. I've got plenty of faults. Some of you could begin to list them. I I have made plenty of mistakes. (laughs) Again, many of you could tell me what they were. I I have hurt plenty of people. Some of you may even be able to say, yeah, I know that, Ian. But without faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, without the guiding and transforming power of the Holy Spirit, without the love and mercy and law of God, I'm pretty sure that my life would have been an even bigger mess, and I would have caused, I would have messed up a lot more. without the Lord in our lives, what, what would we do? And yet, sometimes I look at the lives of other people, and I realize they are getting on just fine. There are so many people who have come to church. Just, just yesterday, I was on my computer, and I was I was tidying up some of my files. It wasn't yesterday. Yesterday, I was at the football. The day before yesterday, I was tidying up some of my files, and, uh, and I came across a video um, from uh, 13 years, um, however many years ago, from 2013, uh, 10 years ago, uh, when the church went to full status. won't go into that. And, and, and there, was lots, there, was a big, there was lots of people here, and it was a video of us all there, and there was a lot of people not here now. It was sad. There was a lot of people who had died, but there was also, I'll be honest, a good number of people, and there have been over the years, a good number of people who've come to church, who've given their lives to Jesus, who have been baptized at the front here, and have quite simply walked away, have uh, chosen a different path. And their lives have not fallen apart. You're going, oh, wait a minute. Excellent. I'm away home from a tea. Um, at least they haven't fallen apart any more than everybody else's. Now, I know that the Bible is very honest about that. The, the Psalms are full of questions about why the wicked flourish, why those who turn their back on God seem to prosper whilst the righteous seem to struggle. And, and there are some answers not least about the final outcome of things. And I certainly believe that without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no ultimate hope, and that only through Jesus can we gain eternal life 
with God. I certainly believe that God's kingdom is coming, has come, will come, and that God will have the last and the loudest word, and that those who belong to Christ will share in the victory, peace, and joy of the kingdom. I believe all of that. But however good the pie in the sky when we die is going to be, and it is going to be good, however well worth holding on for, does our faith, does God being in our lives mean anything now? I believe that it does. Without the Lord, I hate to think of my life, what it would be, what it would have become. And so, my desire is for more of the presence of God in my life, more of the presence of God in my life. But what does that mean, to desire the presence of God in our lives? Because without God in my life, yikes. So, I desire more of the presence. What does that mean? Well, the passage that we've read or that Hillary's just read for us, as I said, is the next part in the Exodus story that we've been following. And we know that uh, the, the people have been given the Ten Commandments. Um, they, they're, they're not that long out of slavery in Egypt, and that they have quickly turned away from faith in God and back to their old ways, uh, making an idol, worshiping a, a golden calf, basically because of fear. We thought about that last week. And although God's judgment was held back from them, again, we saw that last week, the first thing, that ne or the next thing we discover is God threatening to withdraw God's presence from them. God says, I will not go with you. Now, that actually is not an act of punishment or judgment on the people because of their disobedience. It's not God going in the huff and taking the ball back, right? That's it. I've had enough of you guys. I'm away to play with someone else. In fact, it's the opposite. It's actually an act of mercy. If I went with you, God is saying, I might destroy you because you've shown yourselves to be a right bunch of untrustworthy, rebellious, good-for-nothings. Not, not destroy you because God is going to get fed up with them. Oh, that's it. I've had enough. That's it. I've given you your last chance and your last chance, your last chance. No, no. It's because God's truth, God's holiness and sin cannot dwell together. Because God is being true to God's self. And so God, in an act of mercy, is saying, I am going to hold myself back from you because otherwise it would all go wrong. So God's saying, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to go with you. And, 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 and you're not going to come under that judgment. And you're not going to receive all of that. But, says God, at the same time, I'm going to keep my promises. You are going to go into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. I will go ahead of you, or I will send an angel ahead of you. I will ensure your success. But out of mercy, I'm not going to go with you. Now, I wonder if that is a deal we would take. I wonder if that is a deal we do actually try to make with God. God, keep your promises. God, 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 uh, do the things in my life which will help me and strengthen me and bless me and heal me. God, look after me. But other than that, leave me alone. Let me get on with my life in the way that I want to get on with my life. Don't go interfering. Don't tell me what to do. Don't try and make me live a different way. Give me what is good, God. After all, what else are you for? But otherwise, stay out of my life unless I need you. 
Would you take that deal? Have you tried to make that deal? Or, or do you want God in your life, involved in your life? And if so, why? Because it has consequences. Thankfully, Moses and Israel didn't take that deal. Rather, they go into mourning. That's, the, that's why the, the symbolism of stripping off the, the, the jewelry and the, the, the ornaments, their finery, it's an act of mourning at the thought of God withdrawing from them. And, and we have this description of the tent of meeting, which is the place of God's presence amongst them. And we know that's what it is because of the presence of the cloud that symbolized God's presence. It's a place where the, the, the people could come to inquire of the Lord. And we're told that it's a place where God would speak to Moses, it says, face to face as with a friend. In other words, where God would make known to Moses God's will and intention, plans and purposes. Without God in our lives, we cannot fully and properly know God's will. When we seek God's presence in our lives, we do so not simply so that God would be good to us and leave us alone, but that so we would know what the good is and that God would direct us and would lead us in it. In Galatians, for example, Paul urges us to live by the Spirit, the Spirit who is God present in us. For it's the Spirit who teaches us what is contrary to God's way and what is good. The, the fruit of the Spirit, as Paul calls it. He tells us to keep in step with the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. Without God's presence, we cannot know God's will, nor indeed can we actually live according to it. Are you willing to seek God's presence in your life, not simply to give you what you want, but that so that you can know and live according to God's way, so that you can know what the good life is, so that you can allow God to set the agenda for your life. Now, don't just quickly say yes. <laughs> to allow God to set the agenda for your life. But if, if that's what we want to know, and we, we need God in our life so that we can live that way. Moses, in the tent of meeting, effectively says, you, you've revealed your will to me, God, what I'm to do, but I can't do it on my own. I need your help. It, it, Moses asks for a companion, a, a, a helper, and it isn't clear whether he's looking for a, a human or a heavenly helper, but it's worth noting that God's help comes to us through both, through the people of God and through the Spirit of God. But Moses also says, teach me your ways so that I may know you. Teach me your ways so that I may know you. And the Lord replies, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Teach me your way, ways, Lord. I, you, you've, you've told me what your will is. Now, now give me a helper and teach me your ways so that I may know you. And God replies, my presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. This combination of knowledge of God and rest is really important. For what is it that we are seeking for? So far, we've said that we're seeking God's provision in our lives Yep, take that off. God, come help me. Come heal me. Come strengthen me. God, that's what you're for, Lord. Come and do all of that. We're seeking God's provision in our lives. We're seeking God's will for our lives. Are we? God, you set the agenda for my life. We're seeking uh, God's help in living according to God's will. Lord, your spirit, your people. Are we humbling ourselves for that? But here... Moses is seeking something deeper than that. Moses is seeking knowledge 
of God. Not just knowledge about God and God's ways, not just God's activity in his life, but a deep personal relationship with God. And God responds by saying, yes, I'll give you that, and I'll give you rest. My friends, what we are so often seeking is God's will and God's way and God's power in our lives, and that's good. But if we were to seek a deep, personal relationship with God, to know God in deeper and deeper intimacy, then we would find there a place of rest where our striving cease and where in the midst of the storm still raging on, we are at peace. Prophet Isaiah said to Israel, in repentance and rest is your salvation in quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. Will we have some of it? Will we seek that, to be at rest in God by knowing God? God has said yes to Moses. Moses comes seeking God's provision, seeking God's will, seeking God's help, seeking intimacy with God, and to that God has said yes You'd think that was enough. But then Moses seeks two more things. Firstly, Moses asks for God's presence, not only for himself, but for the people. Now, this, of course, is a response to God's earlier merciful withdrawing from them. Here Moses says, no, 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 no. If if you don't go with us, then we're lost. You you need to go with us. And, And you know, that's a dangerous prayer because it was God's merciful withdrawing. But Moses says, if you do not go with us, what else will distinguish us from the other people on the face of the earth? Now, this is something entirely different. Because here Moses is not seeking God's presence for himself or even for the sake of the people. He's He's not seeking God's provision for them first. He's not seeking God's leading of them. He's not seeking God's help for them. He's not even seeking God's special relationship with God for them. Here he's seeking God's presence with them for the sake of the salvation of the world, to put it bluntly. Seeking God being with them so that God's will, God's purposes would be worked out in the world. You see, many of us will seek God's presence because we want God's provision. We want God's help, God's healing, God's peace, etc. Not often enough do we seek God's presence so that we would know God's will and be transformed to live according to God's will. But when we do, We need to seek God's presence to help us live according to God's will. We need to seek God's presence so that we can find rest in the knowledge of of who God is and of the deep, intimate, loving relationship that is ours in Christ. But I, I suspect few of us seek God's presence not for our sake, but for the sake of God's purposes in the world. Not my will, but yours be done. Oh, that we would get to that point of surrender. And then Moses says, now show me your glory. The glory of God is God's presence in all its fullness. It's all God's goodness. It's everything that God's name contains. We we could talk about the glory of God. We could talk about how it's only partially revealed or seen here, and yet it's fully revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. As John puts it at the start of his gospel, in Jesus we have seen the glory of the one and only. We don't have time to to go into all of, of the glory of the what we mean by the glory of God, but 
The point is that having received the answer from God, my presence will go with you. Having heard from God, I will do the very thing that you have asked. My presence will go with the people. In asking to see God's glory, Moses is not asking for God's presence for himself, not seeking God's presence for the people, not even seeking God's presence for the sake of God's purposes in the world. Moses is seeking God's presence simply for the sake of God. Seeking God for God's sake. I'd love to tell you what that's all about, what that really means to seek God for God, except I, I don't think I have, well, I've rarely, I don't think I've ever truly sought God for God's sake. I'd love to be able to say to you, you see, we've gone through this whole kind of stage of why we would seek God's presence. Now we've got to this stage, and it's seeking God for God's sake. And, and when we do that, then, wow, this happens, or that happens, or we experience, or this, or this change happens, except if I was to say that, then that means we would be seeking God's glory for this, or that, or that experience. And that's not what God's calling us to. All I know is that there is coming a time when the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea, when we will know God's presence, and that will be enough. All I know is that in the Spirit of Christ, God is present with us, and we must seek Seek the Lord with all our hearts. Let's not seek God's provision whilst hoping that God stays out of our lives. Let's seek to know God's will in our lives. And let's seek God's help and transforming power at work in our lives. Let's seek a deep and intimate knowledge of God in which we can find our rest. Let's seek God's presence in our lives for the sake of God's work in the world. And let's, let's seek God and go on seeking God. For to know God and the glory of God and enjoy God forever is why we were created. I need God in my life because without the Lord in my life, my life would be a mess. I need God in my life because without the Lord in my life, the, the kingdom of God will not grow. And I, I need God in my life because that is why I was made. And, I, and to know the glory of God and enjoy Him forever is our calling and our purpose. So shall we do that? As Sarah comes and, and leads us in a song of worship, this, this time we can join in with the worship. The words may express what we're feeling. It may be a time that we want to sit and reflect on what are you saying to me, Lord? You might want to take one of the bits of paper and write it down. Or it may be a time when you want to respond to God in prayer. And again, there's bits of paper on the table that might help you to do that. But in this next few moments, what is the Lord saying to you and how will you respond? And then Judith will come and lead us in prayers of intercession. Thanks, Sarah. Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love. Open up our eyes to see you, Jesus, and our ears to hear the cry of your heart for the
Shall we seek the Lord in prayer? Ever-present, glorious God, your transforming presence with us makes us special and distinct in this sinful world. Fill us with abundant life so that we can testify of your goodness to everyone that we meet. You know all the troubles of the world, Lord, especially the complex war between Israel and Palestine. We give thanks that some people are getting out of Gaza now and some aid is getting in to support those who are without water, food, homes, livelihoods, and in many cases, family. But many difficulties remain. Hebrews 12, 14 states, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy 
for without holiness no one will see the Lord. May all warring countries know that truth and your peace upon them, Lord. We pray for our own country as more floods prevail, causing devastation in many parts of the UK. We pray for those with troubled hearts and who are confused about the way forward amid all their loss. We pray for leaders in our nation, for humility and wisdom, as the details from the COVID inquiry show how unprepared, incompetent and lacking in compassion the government were. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. We cannot discern the long-term, even eternal ramifications of our prayer requests. We have to trust God and seek to see life from the eternal perspective. May you open the eyes and hearts of leaders, Lord. We pray for the children and adults who have seen and been involved in the overhyped Halloween, which now seems to last a whole week, gaining more expense and media coverage every year. May they come to know your true light, Lord, instead of the dark, gruesome so-called jokes. Keep families safe tonight as fireworks are set off and may your peace and protection surround all involved, especially those handling the fireworks. We pray for all those involved in the congregation who are in need of extra support at present, whether grieving, with illness of any form, or finding things hard financially or spiritually. Take a minute in silence to offer up those who are on our minds now. We consciously have to set aside time to be in God's presence Otherwise, we end up praying token prayers. We have to be patient, take time to listen, and spend time in the presence reading his word. We offer up now our money, time, and talents for your work in the world, Lord. Shall we join in the prayer that Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And thank you, Judith. Just before we close, I realize some folks may be asking, so how do I seek the presence of Lord, Ian? And the answer is simply Jesus. Um, Jesus is the one to seek in reading God's Word, in being amongst God's people, in receiving the bread and wine of communion, in doing the will of Jesus and Jesus' work in the world. Seek Jesus and you will seek the presence of the Lord. Let's close our service by worshiping together. Thanks, Sarah. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and I wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean I stand amazed I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and I wonder how he could love me a sinner
sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my song. has promised to go with you and never to leave you. So go in peace and may the grace of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today and throughout all your days. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, folks. Bless you.